Mr. Kuleba, today here in Kiev um, we experienced another Russian attack also in Kharkiv. There is dead civilians again um, in Ukraine. Does this already show a lack of air defense? Well, today's morning was loud and unfortunately uh, inflicted uh, damage. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, Russian massive attacks, they, Russia continues to maintain capacity to undertake massive missile attacks. And while uh, we do appreciate every piece of air defense that was moved in Ukraine and the ammunition provided, but uh, in today's attack is a clear evidence that more air defense platforms have to be delivered and more uh, air defense interceptors have to be delivered as well. And this is why we emphasized this point on ev literally every corner. There was this discussion in the past weeks, especially about Patriot, that there is not enough rockets for you uh, to shoot down Russian missiles, ballistic missiles especially. Is there a dramatic lack of this right now? Well, I, I will not disclose uh, the, uh, our air def and compromise our air defense capacity, but uh, definitely the sustainability of supply of Patriot interceptors, PAC-2 and PAC-3, is uh, an issue that has to be resolved. These Please. missiles have to be sub de delivered in sufficient quantities in due time. With which countries are you dealing about it? US with also Germany? With all countries. And uh, we appreciate the decision that Germany took last year to deliver another Patriot battery to Ukraine. Um, but the country is big. There are many targets that cities that need to be protected. Basically, one, one Patriot battery can protect entire city. And uh, uh, we should always remember that protecting a city is also protecting Ukraine's economy so that it can function, generate revenue and uphold economic stability. Beside the air defense, we talk to many soldiers and generals at the front line in Avdiivka, Bakhmut region, Donbas in general, and the situation there seems to be particularly getting dramatic. Soldiers are telling us that they don't have enough artillery, ammunition, and that sometimes they have zero to defend themselves. How could it come to this? Well, the insufficiency of, uh, the insufficient amount of artillery ammunition has been an issue since, since day one. And while Ukraine ramped up its production uh, significantly, um, and we will continue to do so, we still see that uh, Western defense industries, so defense industries of the countries who are helping us, are incapable of producing sufficient amount of uh, artillery ammunition. And this is a very important question because it's not only about the security of Ukraine, it's also a soft spot in the security of uh, uh, your own countries, including Germany. Uh, because your country has one of the strongest defense industries in the world. We see the European Union is lagging behind on meeting its commitment to deliver one million artillery shells to Ukraine. We see that the um, uh, production, uh, the new lines of, uh, uh, to produce artillery ammunition are being rolled out behind schedule, ramping up, does not, uh, this production uh, does not meet the needs of the war in Ukraine, but also of uh, the defense uh, needs of your own countries. And uh, I think there are two main issues for that. First, governments and defense industries should stop blaming, and I'm sorry if I sound too blunt, but I think it's, it's, That's important. Okay. it's, important, it's important to identify the problem. So first, defense industries and governments should stop blaming each other for not working enough or for not doing enough to ramp up production. Uh, and second, uh, um, EU countries, maybe NATO countries, should, should all sit down together and ease regulations um, and, and, and align them in a way that would remove all uh, administrative and uh, uh, barriers which uh, slow down uh, the ramp up of uh, production of artillery ammunition. These are two key issues. 
And when we speak uh, at the political level uh, with both EU and NATO and national governments, everyone is in favor of ramping up production. But when it comes to making specific decisions, we see how our partners sometimes drown in endless discussions. But the problem is that there is no time to drown. We have to swim. We have to swim sometimes against the flow, but uh, we, it's in all our common interest uh, to see the production of artillery ammunition ramped up. You mentioned it. There is no time. If there is not more ammunition coming to Ukraine, more weapons, do you expect a Russian breakthrough through the lines in the east? Because the situation is crucial right now, especially in Avdivka and in other regions at the moment. Well, I'm confident in the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, but how can you be confident if they don't have ammunition to defend themselves? The problem is that defending the front line without sufficient amount of artillery ammunition will come at a much higher cost in terms of lives of Ukrainian soldiers. We will be maneuvering, we will be holding the Russians, uh, but of course it will come at a higher price. And this is why we demand, we ask, we beg, we insist in every communication that we have to ramp up production, to uh, uh, deliver artillery ammunition to the front line. But again, you said it would cost more lives, but how can you hold the line, hold the front at the line where you are right now without ammunition? Well, um, you are trying to push me into a clickbait headline that... Uh, will we don't work with that Russia, that Russia That Russia will break, break the lines and uh, will break through. Again, as I told you, um, I speak with soldiers um, and officers regularly, and they all have one complaint, artillery ammunition. As I told you, Ukraine has dramatically ramped up its production. We rolled out some new lines of producing 155th caliber, for example. But um, every time, uh, but all soft soldiers and officers report that Russia dominates in terms of the amount of artillery ammunition available to it. Also, uh, because um, they receive supplies from North Korea. So as ridiculous as it may sound, but it seems that North Korea is a more efficient partner to Russia than, uh, uh, than France who tried to supply uh, Ukraine with artillery ammunition. And that's ridiculous and it must be changed. And while we appreciate everything that we received, but the scale of the war demands more. And it's not us who define this scale. This is Russia. It's Russia who has to blame, who has to be blamed for this, for this scale and, uh, of the war. But this is the reality that we all have to address. If you see the problems right now, which are there on the table already, what does it make you feel that Donald Trump could be back as first candidate, but maybe president? Does the thought of Trump as a president worry you? Well, people of America will make their choice. You know, we are in no position to influence that choice. And uh, we will work with uh, a man, a woman, whatever his or her name uh, will be. Uh, I mean, the president of the United States. So life taught me not to worry about anything, but to work tirelessly every day on solving problems as they appear. And that's, that's our attitude towards the potential outcome of the elections in the United States. So you're not worried? I'm not, again, I'm not worried uh, uh, about anything because there is no sense in being worried. What makes sense is to work tirelessly. If you face a problem, you have to fix it. It's a different philosophy. In Washington, $60 billion in aid for your country is still not accepted. And in Brussels, it's 50 billion euros. Will Ukraine really have to defend itself with spades, as you recently put it? And um, if this aid fails, what consequences does it have? Well, I'm sure you're aware that some... Uh, some experts uh, uh, suggest, some experts in the West suggest that if Ukraine is, does not receive the assistance it needs from the United States and from the European Union, 
then it will be uh, more inclined to uh, negotiate with Russia and to make concessions. And when I made the point about the shovels, uh, uh, this was the point addressed to Western audiences and to these people who entertain this kind of analysis. And I said that whatever, <coughs> whatever happens, we will keep fighting. So it was a metaphor. Even if you don't have enough weapons and ammunition, you will still be at the front and not go for negotiation. We will, we will, first, we will be solving problems as we begin to face them. Uh, second, uh, um, I'm optimistic about the outcome of deliberations in both the European Union and the United States. I believe the solution will be found. In what doesn't make you optimistic? Uh, conversations with stakeholders and decision makers. And, uh, so you still think the money is coming at some point? Yes, I think the money are coming. But uh, the point is not that Ukraine will run out of weapons. The point is that uh, whatever happens, Ukraine will keep fighting because what is at stake here is the security and existence of Ukraine, but also the security of Europe. As a foreign minister, obviously you travel a lot. Um, you meet a lot of ministers, uh, head of states. How often do you have the feeling that they lost confidence in Ukraine winning back all territory? Because that's what I keep hearing if I talk to head of states in the background or in with foreign ministers, that many of them don't believe anymore that Ukraine can really retake the whole country. So they would argue there is a line now and maybe soon we have to negotiate. I th I believe those who think along these lines, they lost confidence in themselves, not in Ukraine. Um, because Ukraine has proven so many times that it can defeat Russia when, he, when it has everything that it needs at, at hand. But when I hear these kind of arguments that, oh, we don't think it's possible, we don't think so it's So you feasible. hear it as well from... Um, and no, not not states? not from not from uh, not in our official uh, official context, but rather from expert community who try to influence official circles. But um, I, I I I do believe that the West has to finally believe in itself because it's it has to stand up to the historic challenge of the threat posed by Russia and its allies to the world uh, built by the West. Do Ukrainians still believe in themselves? Yes. Do you think the majority of the people in Ukraine still believe they can retake whole territory Donbas, Luhansk, Crimea? If I read, if I read the polls, uh, I clearly see that the majority of Ukrainians believe that um, we still we have the capacity to restore our territorial integrity, which is returning our land that uh, people of, uh, the people of Ukraine are against making territorial concessions to Russia, that people of Ukraine believe in the membership of, the, of Ukraine in the EU and NATO. Um, this is not my, uh, I'm not referring to my e ec uh, echo chamber. It's uh, the opinion people, people I speak yeah. to, but I just follow thoroughly the opinion polls on this. We talked about ammunition, about the packages from the US and EU. At the same time in Germany, we still have a discussion about Taurus. And I remember in summer when some ministers traveled here, there was the finance minister, foreign minister, defense minister. They more or less promised that Taurus will come at some point. Then Chancellor Scholz took the decision he doesn't want to deliver Taurus. Do you still have hope of getting Taurus or is it over? We, first, we never give up. Second, uh, we keep uh, talking to the, uh, to the German government on this matter. And I think no, no issue is closed once and forever. Uh, everything depends on the political circumstances and on the uh, uh, factual needs and demands of the front line. The fear is that you would use towers to attack Moscow or other we Russian don't need, We don't need Taurus to attack Moscow. We don't need long-range missiles provided by uh, our Western partners to attack uh, Moscow or territory <coughs> or any other part of the territory of Russia. Uh, we need them to destroy uh, Russian military infrastructure behind the front line in the territory of Ukraine. 
Let me quote our Defense Minister Pistorius who recently gave an interview um, and he rejects more German military aid for now uh, for Ukraine. He says, and I quote, we can't go all in, otherwise we would be left defenseless ourselves and so far we have supplied everything that is possible. What does it mean for your country's defense? Well, it brings us back to the conversation about defense industries. And uh, uh, if you say that you run out of your, uh, of your reserves, the stockpiles, then the second question is what is being done and what has been done to replenish these stockpiles with the production of uh, new equipment. And the uh, German defense industry is the most powerful one in Europe. So this is why again and again we emphasize the need uh, for them, for governments and, and defense industries to work together. Second, it's, it's really hard and unfair to blame, uh, to blame uh, Germany because uh, it's number one in Europe on, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, volume of military assistance uh, provided, provided to Ukraine. But to, this again brings us back to the issue of confidence. I mean, you, <coughs> um, we all have to be confident that Europe is capable of ensuring its security. There is another quote from our Defense Minister Pistorius said, quote, it must be clear to everyone, if Putin wins this war and occupies Ukraine, the danger for the alliance area will naturally increase. So he referred to NATO. And it means the German Defense Minister thinks that a Rus Russian victory against your country is possible. And he talks about it publicly. And he justifies this by saying, that Germany can no longer provide military or more military aid. Can you understand him? Uh, well, I have no reasons to question the commitment of uh, defense, uh, German defense minister to working with Ukraine. He has been very constructive in engaging recently. But I think that, uh, again, uh, mm, people, officials, decision makers, stakeholders should should stop theorizing about potential Russian victory uh, because uh, Ukraine will be the first victim of that but Germany and other European nations will be the second and there won't be a long uh, time gap between, uh, between these two. So this is why the best way to ensure the security of Germany and other European and NATO nations is to provide Ukraine with everything that it needs to defeat Russia and to liberate Ukrainian territories. When, when we hear uh, people downs, downsliding into discussions, oh, is it possible or is it not possible? Uh, this is just a wrong, wrong approach to policy. You have to be focused on victory because you understand that losing will, for, will induce a much, much higher price on you. Do you think it's possible that Putin, that the Russian army would attack Germany? Uh, Russia will attack uh, a NATO country. Not probably, I don't, I don't know whether it will be Germany immediately, but I think uh, I'm confident that if Russia prevails in Ukraine, we will not allow it to happen, but since you're asking a hypothetical question, I give you a hypothetical answer. The next move will be on NATO. And once a NATO country is attacked, Germany um, will find it very, very difficult to stand away. Thank you very much for the interview, Mr. Minister. Thank you.